All right. So I know um, we're still having some folks join us today. Um, welcome, everybody, to our um, American Tennis Association uh, Community Forum on Research. Um, I'll just give it a couple more moments since there's about 40 more people who are trying to join, and we want to make sure that they can um, participate uh, and listen as much as possible. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just start with some opening opening comments here. So um, so first, uh, you know, there was a, a, a terrific response from the tinnitus community, um, and we really appreciate the engagement from everybody um, here today and also those who will be tuning into the recording later. Um, we won't be able to answer all of the questions, but there will be another public forum, forum in the spring to follow up on questions that are not addressed here, um, as well as uh, some of the questions that are raised in the chat um, or, um, or those that are submitted uh, after this session. Um, if you have more questions, you can email them to tinnitus at ata.org. Um, and and we'll go ahead and, and write that in the chat too, just so um, you have that reference. We do have an overwhelming response today. There's still um, 50 more people in the waiting room, so we'll um, we'll try to get those folks in, and then we'll we'll try to keep everyone on mute so that we can all um, hear our, our speakers today. All right. Well, we're really excited to see this turnout today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, uh, just as a quick introduction, um, I'm moderating this session today. Um, this is the American Tinnitus Association Community Forum on Research. Um, and um, my name is Rebecca Lewis. I'm a Chief of Audiology at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Um, I have, I'm a researcher and an audiologist um, and have a deep interest in tinnitus uh, and, and um, have, have worked with the American Tinnitus Association for a few years now. So it's really great to be here. Um, I will turn it over to each of our speakers to, um, to have a, a short introduction. Uh, Dr. Jin Sheng Sheng, um, would you like to give a quick introduction of yourself and, and your background? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jin Sheng Zhang, I'm professor and at the Winston University, and uh, I have a joint appointment uh, with uh, the department. It's called, it's called a Laryngology and also uh, the communication science disorder to the two departments. And so I run uh, a wet lab using animal model to study tentative mechanisms and also in, and develop a treatment uh, strategies. Uh, currently, I'm leading a large multi-center clinical trial and targeting a TNF alpha sig signaling pathway. And administratively, uh, I serve as uh, the department chair as communication science disorders, which means speech language pathologists and audiologists. And uh, another administrator right now is I'm the chair of the board of American Tinnitus Association, where uh, briefly an ATA is uh, uh, all the board and staff are uh, quite uh, motivated to uh, work for the organization, uh, eventually benefit or uh, general audiences or tinnitus members. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Mark Fagelson, would you like to give a quick, quick introduction? Sure. Thanks. My name is Mark Fagelson. I am a professor at East Tennessee State University, and I see patients both at our campus clinic and at the James H. Quillen Mountain Home VA Medical Center across the street. I've been working with patients bothered by tinnitus now for more than 20 years. Uh, I teach a course in tinnitus management to our doc students in audiology. Uh, I started uh, working with the ATA several years ago, was recently voted in as the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, a role that I am uh, in incredibly humbled to uh, be to be taking and an, an organization to be a part of. So I really look like it, uh, look at it like it's our privilege to be here today, and I'm hoping that we can get to the, as many questions as possible, and I'll shut up now so we can start doing that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and and uh, as a as a reminder, we did have a very uh, robust response from the tinnitus community for this session. So um, we won't be able to get to all of the questions that were submitted today. Uh, but there's going to be another public forum in the spring to follow up on any questions um, or as many questions as possible that um, that are not addressed uh, here during this session. So um, if you do have additional questions, please feel free to submit those to the email address. It's tinnitus 
at ata.org. Um, you can also find that in the chat. So um, without further ado, let's jump in. Um, we will go ahead and get started with kind of some general um, questions about uh, tinnitus research. So um, the first question that we have, uh, and you know, feel free to jump in, uh, Jin Chang and Mark. Um, uh, what kind of research, if any, is being done to find out what causes tinnitus? Uh, I can jump in here. Uh, you know, we know a lot about what causes tinnitus in a lot of different populations, and uh, that's sort of good news and bad news. The good news is, yeah, we do know sort of where tinnitus comes from in a variety of different cases. Um, however, the heterogeneity, the differences across those different cases and those different mechanisms for tinnitus make it impractical to think that there's any one specific cause. So if we speak generally of the kind of subjective tinnitus that seems to bother probably the largest segment of the population of patients with bothersome tinnitus, that, that experience of hearing a sound that nobody else hears, there's nothing going on in the environment producing it. That kind of experience has uh, drawn a lot of attention, obviously, over the decades. And for many, many people, it seems that that tinnitus is arising more or less as a side effect, a byproduct of a very natural compensatory adjustment that the brain and the central auditory pathway make after a person has acquired some kind of change in hearing. What we've learned is that it's very frustrating for a lot of patients to be told that they have normal hearing because there were normal results on a pure tone audiogram, and yet here they are bothered by tinnitus. So I think in, in, in terms of the way we want to interpret that, let's recognize that that audiogram is not a perfect fail-proof assessment of a person's auditory sensitivity and processing, and that there can be changes that occur that are not reflected on that audiogram that can be very important in terms of sort of predisposing conditions for the generation and maintenance of a tinnitus signal. So I, I kind of wish there was a one simple answer for the question of where tinnitus comes from, but I think there are many different answers, uh, many different correct answers. Um, and uh, I think the thing that frustrates a lot of people, uh, again, is being told there's nothing wrong when in fact they know that something is uh, going on. Um, I totally agree with uh, Mark, and you hit uh, a very important uh, point that uh, the brain's uh, compensatory process uh, itself uh, causes the perceptor or perception of a tinnitus. In terms of the uh, current uh, efforts in, in research, and to uh, basically uh, many of the research uh, tools approaches are surrounded at these. Uh, a common theme, a common hypothesis of the etiology of tinnitus, although the the triggers of the formats of oh, this is uh, uh, the etiology of very complex, as Mark pointed out, and um, and so uh, basically the research are conducted in in many ways. Uh, one is the animal model, and uh, the other one is the human and studies. And uh, there is also a uh, computer, you know, computation modeling. And so uh, these are the approaches to uh, address uh, the uh, etiology of tinnitus. At the same time, all of these uh, approaches uh, can, you know, always uh, uh, bear in mind. And, you know, if we find the corporate or the signals, the unwanted signals underpinning the tinnitus, and uh, how are you going to do? So many times, uh, our clinical uh, clinician colleagues and uh, rich clinician scientists or scientists, the uh, uh, introduce or intervene certain type of manipulation to uh, change, you know, to seeking the therapeutic effects. At the same time, the results and uh, data collected that can help. Uh, further validate uh, the hypothesis of what's going on in uh, the etiology. In the uh, more specifically, you know, it's, this is a kind of a general direction of the research, you know, and uh, one is the, uh, you know, the uh, electrophysiology, and uh, it's a recording uh, in the, for example, the animal model, and uh, very occasionally in human subjects and by studying the clinical issues and then and try to uh, poke, uh, you know, the uh, properties 
uh, investigate the property of the, the neuron uh, nerve cells in the brain in different centers. You know, so the humans is more uh, accessible in the cerebral level, but the animal models uh, uh, we can access uh, different uh, brain stations or, or centers in the brain uh, from the brain stem in the middle brain and uh, 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 cerebral cortex and other uh, non uh, auditory and uh, non traditional auditory in the uh, those centers uh, are involved in cognition uh, attention centers to tease out uh, their uh, properties of firing in the, the neurons and also the nerve cells that they are interconnected with each other uh, within the per, per, uh, particular centers, but also the across the different brain stations to tease out the uh, characteristics of the connectivity and electrophysiology and a functional MRI and resting state of functional MRI to, to study the con coherence of the functional connectivity between centers and uh, so the neurotransmitters and the single cells, the iron channels and neurotransmitter pathways, we can develop a pharmacological uh, agents. So uh, just uh, uh, briefly, uh, there are lots of research uh, uh, going on, even stem cell gene therapy, infrared light uh, I can touch on uh, momentarily. So just uh, in a nutshell, there are many approaches or by our colleagues uh, happened today with Rebecca at the clinician, uh, Marcus, the clinician, me as a scientist today to help you provide the information that uh, to our knowledge and the many colleagues in the field, they're actively pursuing, uh, study the mechanism underlying tinnitus and to pursue the uh, treatment options. I stop here for this now. Yeah, and you actually provided a great segue because um, you know we do know that there's a lot of research going on um, in in this field um, regarding the causes of tinnitus. Um, we have another question that's more focused on um, understanding some research around finding an objective measure for tinnitus. So um, the 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 question is, you know, do you expect that we'll have an objective measure for tinnitus soon, and how does that actually help uh, patients and researchers? Uh, I can start again, unless Jinsheng, do you want? Did you look like you, you were about to say ahead. something? Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. That's good. That's um, good. Uh, for an for an objective measure, uh, it uh, some patients feel very strongly about others understanding what it is they're experiencing, and this is, of course, very understandable. So, an objective measure would, in a sense, validate the experience for the patient and that person's support group, their family, uh, and their friends. The, uh, the the cautionary tone that I would like to strike with regard to an objective measure is that if it's like anything else having to do with most of what we know about tinnitus, it's not going to work equally well for everyone. And so the thought of somebody being not believed or having benefits or, or something withdrawn because they didn't pass this objective test, that to me would be very concerning. Uh, we can try to validate the experience for patients in a variety of different ways if that indeed is something that they want. But for an objective test, uh, again, I think the value would be that it would confirm, it would provide, provide confirmatory evidence for the patient and their family that this individual is experiencing tinnitus. Um, uh, my own, in practice, my, my own approach here is if somebody tells me they have bothersome tinnitus, I believe them. And I don't need to know exactly what it sounds like. I don't need to know the you know, it's details in that regard because I figure they have better things to do than come to my office to talk to me about bothersome tinnitus if they don't have it. So an objective measure, again, I think has potentially some value and, and uh, may certainly in the future have value in terms of guiding therapies. Uh, we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, but uh, I also, the other side of that coin, the one I kind of worry about would be people uh, having their reports of tinnitus uh, belittled or not believed as they should be simply because they didn't happen to pass that one particular objective test. Yeah. I agree with the Mark. Uh, you covered the, all the information. This is a subject that this is a, actually, it's a very important uh, uh, 
uh, question, I appreciated the question being asked. And uh, uh, thus far uh, in uh, research field and uh, clinical practice, we all know uh, there is no uh, effective or, or reliable objective measure yet. We always uh, count on the questionnaires and commonly used tinnitus uh, functional index and reaction questionnaire. Uh, questionnaire, and then um, we also the audiologist. Uh, you know, you see the clinicians the provide uh, uh, loudness match uh, to, and the pitch match, or a, min a minimum masking threshold. And all this is uh, based on the reports uh, from uh, the tinnitus. Uh, uh, patients, so that so basically that's the current uh, you know way of uh, handling how to test the tinnitus. Uh, so there's no um, objective measure yet. However, uh, efforts have been made, are being made, and uh, so um, it really because it's uh, if you make uh, important progress in developing a reliable objective measure or tool. Uh, that means uh, it can help, you know, as Mark pointed out, really can be uh, beneficial, can help uh, identify uh, what type of tinnitus, what causes tinnitus, so that uh, that will guide uh, the uh, therapeutic uh, strategy. So just a um, brief mention in 2017 uh, with the uh, career group uh, led by Dr. Han, H-A-N, they published a paper and uh, try to establish a so-called acoustic uh, change uh, uh, complex. And so this is called based on the cortical N1, P1 responses. So they recorded these responses and to, and to uh, give a sound stimulation and a different intensity and different frequency and the matches of the tinnitus quality. And they find uh, some type of correlation so there is some uh, uh, research going on. If you're interested, you can dig into the literature. And uh, I just chime in, uh, uh, you know, compliment uh, to, uh, to Mark's response on this subject. It's a very important uh, subject. It's a big challenge to scientists and uh, clinicians in identifying a reliable objective measure. And if I could just add one thing real quick, it doesn't, Please. an objective measure that identifies the sound of the tinnitus, but that does not identify the reaction to the tinnitus would not be particularly useful uh, because everybody hears their own tinnitus sound and everybody reacts to it in a different way. There are many people who coexist with full-time tinnitus simply because it does not provoke in them a, a negative reaction. So uh, an objective measure must be able to account for not just the tinnitus sound, but the tinnitus reaction, arguably more important. Great point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great point. And, um, you know, that's, uh, a, another kind of great segue to another question that's more focused on, um, trying to resolve the sound, um, trying to actually find, uh, something to cure the tinnitus to completely remove that sound. So, um, Jin Shang, maybe this is a question for you. Um, what research is being done to cure tinnitus and are there any promising studies either that are current or in the pipeline in the future, um, aimed at, at curing tinnitus? Um, yes, as, as I said, uh, clinician scientists and uh, our scientists, uh, they actively uh, are pursuing and different, you know, different uh, directions and, and from different angles so, and try to find a solution that uh, are, are working. So, uh, as yeah. you know, there currently there is two uh, uh, products that are rolled out. Uh, they're based on by model uh, neuromodulation, right? That's a... Uh, uh, it's a linear one. It's a product it's called linear, and so the other one is um, uh, the uh, uh, the by Dr. Susan Shore. You know, this is all this. This is a uh, you know the currently the devices are are but but at the same time along this line, uh, what I mean is uh, there are lots of research. They are still continuing uh, for for their to polish their approaches, and. Um, so um, the other one, it's uh, the uh, cochlear implants, and basically for uh, 
patient subjects uh, who have a severe or profound hearing loss, and they happen to uh, use uh, uh, you know cochlear implants, and this has been shown in many patients, their tinnitus uh, can be helped by uh, utilizing the cochlear stimulate electrostimulation if the cochlear implants are introduced. They, these are the research is still ongoing, and um, <clears throat> so. Um, the in my lab, right? We, uh, my colleague, uh, over the uh, quite a number of years, and we uh, found uh, one type of uh, a cytokine, inflammatory cytokine. It's called a TNF alpha and tumor necrosis of factor alpha uh, by targeting and this uh, pathway, and we can uh, medicate uh, the behavior evidence of tinnitus in the animal studies uh, right now as I speak. We are actively enrolling uh, subjects uh, who meet uh, the inclusion and uh, excluding criteria as to uh, participate. And so we use uh, the uh, um, embryo or adenocept and by uh, basically with the animal uh, model it works. And But uh, we wanted to make a, a clinical statement to, to see whether it works, if it works, and then that would allow us uh, to work with the pharmaceutical company to synthesize uh, smaller molecules or uh, chemical compounds that has uh, uh, more robust therapeutic effects and minimal uh, side effects. So this um, research is basically targeting this uh, a cytokine pathway. And it sounds like, okay, you would try to reduce inflammation. Yes, it is. It's uh, at the same time, because this is signaling pathway has been shown uh, to be involved uh, in the neurotransmitter pathway in the balance, for example, related to GABA, urge, GABA urge is inhibitory neurotransmitter. So, uh, so it does have its uh, role in the mediating the uh, balance of excitation and inhibition in the brain. And uh, ultimately, we always use a term is called a maladaptive neuroplasticity. That is a general term considered to be as a neuro underpinning of tinnitus. So if uh, you can do anything that uh, can mitigate or retrieve or even reset the neuro, uh, maladaptive neuroplasticity, uh, we would expect uh, the relief uh, of uh, uh, tinnitus uh, symptoms. So ultimately, this approach, uh, we would like to seek uh, the mitigation or reset of the neuromaladaptive mal neuroplasticity. So, and uh, the other one is uh, our group, uh, we, um, um, we have demonstrated, we published uh, in the book uh, that uh, Dr. Grant Searchfield and me, we edited a book, it's called a Behavioral Neuroscience and published in 2021. So welcome to refer to that book. So uh, we uh, develop a drug, it's called a Gabador. It's a Gabador is a, a, a drug synthesized by uh, Ao a striker and from SUNY Downstate. So basically by putting together, it's a, one is a pregabalin and the other one is a low peptin. So by basically using the uh, accumulative effect of uh, the inhibiting the calpain pathway, it's a kind of a uh, calcium uh, uh, activation process of inhibiting that uh, can help or preserve the, uh, or uh, protect uh, the cells, uh, hair cells, uh, low peptin, and uh, the pregabalin also has uh, the GABAergic en enhancement effect. So that's what we showed in the animal model uh, that uh, has a robust uh, suppressive effects on tinnitus. So that's one, um, you know, because so we all know there's no, um, you know, the uh, appeal, uh, so-called, you know, so uh, pharmacological solution yet. So that's why uh, my lab and my team have been very active pursuing these uh, two directions. And another one is so uh, we um, I just uh, made a presentation to the uh, Association for Research in Otolaryngology by reporting the new data collected in my lab and, and in collaboration, my collaborators, by using infrared light and uh, at a 950 nanometer uh, wavelength, uh, we showed 
quite a robust uh, suppressive effects of a tinnitus. And uh, not only, there are some publications and and show the therapeutic effects uh, on human subject uh, tinnitus. So uh, you're welcome to look into this area. The scientific basis of this area is uh, to use the light to uh, modulate. Uh, there is an enzyme, it's called a cytochrome C, is in the organelle, it's called a mitochondrial. It's a subcellular organelle, it's inside the cell to really regulate the energy um, activity and also the um, bad stock is, we call that a reactive oxygen species. Eventually that will lead to the inflammation in a cell death and so all goes to show the preservations of the hair cells and uh, uh, provide the relief of tinnitus. So in the animal model, we show how we're working on the manuscript we're working on. So uh, two other things uh, I wanted to mention, stem cell, and you know that, and stem cell and progenitor cell and can be induced to in a, in a different uh, uh, organ or the system or body to uh, differentiate uh, into the cell types so that uh, um, hopefully it can function with the nearby to support the uh, tissue functions or, or, or nearby. And so their research, that's its future direction. Um, but this area, you know, is so it's still on its, uh, it's, at its early stage. Uh, how to make the stem cells survive, for example, in the brain, and uh, how to really uh, functional, you know, to uh, for long long term, and also without causing side effect, just to, just to research, and gene therapy, and uh, there's a report uh, that this year's of conference uh, by modulating is called a gene, it's called an autofurlin gene. Autofurlin gene is very important in maintaining the functions of the hair cells, sending signal to the brain for the hearing uh, uh, process. So, and uh, that would be the direction. And so if we'll, the gene yeah. therapy, and so, uh, but it's okay. uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, clinical uh, stage, uh, it's, it's, it's an early stage. So I stop yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. I think there is a lot of research being done and it's, um, it's easy to kind of get through, uh, a lot of details in a very short amount of time here. Um, so, uh, you know, just to follow up on, um, one of the comments you had, uh, you know, you're studying inflammation as it relates to tinnitus. Um, one of the questions that we received was, uh, was specifically asking if an anti-inflammatory diet would be helpful for reducing tinnitus perception. Is that something that either of you would recommend at this time? Um, uh, uh, first, uh, yeah, thank you, Rebecca, and thank uh, uh, you know the the questions. Uh, this is a very important question. Uh, first, uh, you know, I'm not licensed uh, medical doctor, and uh, I you always I always um, uh, share my uh, knowledge and my thoughts, and but you always uh, you know. Uh, recommended to consult uh, your doctor clinicians to who are licensed to to give you eventually prescriptions or or, or you know so, but I can share the uh, knowledge uh, that uh, um, and that I know that uh, inflammation we all know causes a, a lots of uh, a problem, whether triggered by the endogenous factors you know for example the autoimmune disorders we all know is the it's in it's inside endogenous inside or the um from outside you know so the cut wound you know the all wise the wound you know it develops so it's a uh, inflammation kicking right away even the cochlear implant is also the cytokine storm in introduced causing the cell death and degenerative process that affect the eventually the clinical outcome uh, of a hearing for the cochlear implants for example but in tinnitus, uh, uh, we we think that inflammation is important, and uh, we have a chapter. And Dr. Abel Schumer, one a legendary person in the field, we co-authored with this uh, uh, this chapter, this uh, article in the Behavior Neuroscience. So we talked about uh, the importance of uh, neuroinflammation in tinnitus and etiology and possible and treatment options. So by lowering, by mitigate the inflammatory process in the body, especially in the ear or the brain, 
and, and that it should uh, expect it to. I, earlier I mentioned that uh, help rebalance the excitation inhibition of the you know, through the neurotransmitter pathway at least eventually will help maintain a balance of uh, maladaptive neuroplasticity, retweaking, resetting. Uh, so that would be my uh, sharing of uh, the information in this regard. Yeah, and and um, Mark, I'm going to follow up with you next. Um, it, it's a little bit related to the inflammation questions, um, but can go a little bit broader here. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a debate in the field for a long time um, around whether tinnitus is a brain issue or an inner ear issue. Um, so we received a question: um, you know, is it true that tinnitus is a brain issue rather than a problem associated with the inner ear? Um, and if tinnitus is a condition in the brain, shouldn't individuals with tinnitus be seen by a neurologist other, uh, rather than an ENT specialist? What are your thoughts around that? So sure. And kind of as right where we started, sometimes tinnitus is an inner ear problem, Meniere's disease. Uh, but more commonly, as uh, Jin Ching was saying, it's the result of some kind of ad adaptive or compensatory central nervous system uh, a response to changes in hearing. All that said, uh, why is it more important uh, appropriate to go to an audiologist or an otolaryngologist than a neurologist? Well, a neurologist probably is not going to be able to do a lot for tinnitus. Uh, there aren't operations that are going to fix the problem. Um, so, uh, I, actually, if I if I had a choice, I, I would look more toward a psychologist, perhaps, if somebody has a very powerful negative emotional reaction to the tinnitus event. Um, the, uh, the, the idea that audiologists and ENTs should be the front line makes a lot of sense. We can work with sound therapy in a way that a neurologist probably would not be able to. We have the time to do the kind of counseling, detailed uh, counseling that sometimes is referred to as demystification of the tinnitus event. Um, and, and what kind of interests me is why would that work? Why would somebody learning more about their tinnitus actually help? Uh, because it seems like a very small gesture. Yet for a lot of patients, it makes a big difference. And I, th I think we have a lot to learn from the trauma literature in that regard, in the sense that when an individual understands the challenge a bit more accurately, realistically, they can have mo more of a hand in their own healing uh, as opposed to this negative event being imposed upon them and there's no way to manage it. It's going to be very complex no matter what, but I like to think that as uh, as audiologists, otolaryngologists, uh, with support from individuals who understand cognitive behavioral therapy and psychology, that if we cannot remove the tinnitus sound, we can at least make it less unreasonable for the person to manage it. Yeah, that's a that's a great answer. Thank you. And and kind of segues into another question, which um, uh, could could uh, relate to what you just said. So um, uh, our next question is: uh, Does research tell us anything about why some individuals experience fluctuating tinnitus? with some days when it's barely perceivable to other days when it's extremely loud. And if the tinnitus is new, is that an indication that it might go away? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just jump in, I guess. Um, sure. Well, that's a, that's a, that's one of those million dollar questions. Um, yeah. And it is uh, as with many other environmental uh, sensory events, and environmentally derived sensory events, the more dynamic it is, the more difficult it will be to get your mind off of it. So a patient who has fluctuating tinnitus, tinnitus that sounds one way part of the day in a different way, another part of the day, or that changes routinely, that's going to be a very difficult tinnitus to ignore because it is very dynamic. What I would uh, encourage people to do, however, is that if they do notice those kinds of changes, look for a pattern. Uh, is it a certain time of the week, certain time of day? Did you just eat something? What, did you want to just eat something, but you didn't get an opportunity to? Did you take, a, a, has your medication changed? Uh, did you move? Uh, are you drinking a different kind of bottled water? I mean, there. It, I know that all seems small, but any one of those things 
we have found can change somebody's tinnitus, can modify the neural activity that's responsible for the tinnitus. And I've had a, a stunning uh, amount of success working with patients for whom I, I was able to get them to go see a rheumatologist or somebody to do an allergy workup for them. And they felt they had exhausted every avenue. And it turned out that they had an allergy that would come and go. And depending on what they were eating or drinking uh, might you know, get worse uh, or might flare up and that their tinnitus was related to that. Uh, so again, the diet is important. Um, monitoring what we do is important. And if somebody has fluctuating tinnitus, uh, I know we always tell patients to try not to think about their tinnitus, but uh, uh, sometimes keeping a journal, sometimes looking for patterns can be a very uh, a very good way to start at trying to kind of come to grips with a, a tinnitus that does change like that. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's um, also trying to find that balance between um, trying not to pay attention to it too much to reinforce that pathway and um, trying to arm yourself with the knowledge of what's going on and trying to find those patterns so you can better help yourself. I, I think that's a really great point. Um, so we'll have a, a kind of it might seem like a diversion, but um, those of you who are uh, attending today might already know that hyperacusis is often associated with tinnitus. Um, and we wanted to take a moment to kind of address this question. Um, do do we know, you know, uh, or could one of you speak a little bit about that association and, you know, what the most promising research into understanding hyperacusis is, um, especially related to uh, a cure or, or um, effective management? I can do it if you want. Sure, yeah. go ahead. I can start. Yeah. Uh, hyperacusis, uh, and by hyperacusis, you know, let's keep in mind it's a family that's nearly as diverse as the tinnitus family. Um, there are different forms of hyperacusis, likely different causes. Um, but if we just talk about uh, disorders of sound tolerance, perhaps, maybe we can uh, use that as an umbrella term as well. Um, clearly, mechanistically, there are some similarities. So if we look at tinnitus as being a side effect of a neural compensation for changes in hearing, specifically reduced sensitivity, then it's not too much of a stretch to imagine that those same kinds of changes could uh, perhaps go overboard for a lack of a better way to put it, and might actually produce in some individuals then the sensation of excessive loudness even though they're the individuals who have the hearing loss. So it's a, it's a bit of a paradoxical situation that many individuals who end up uh, displaying pure tone threshold loss on an audiogram uh, may end up noticing that some sounds seem louder than they used to. And because they've lost some hearing, they don't wanna lose any more, they tend to start wearing earplugs perhaps too often. And so we are well aware that uh, hearing protection can be overused. And one of the consequences of that would be that somebody's loudness tolerance might actually continue to get worse, even though with the best of intentions, they're trying to do the thing that seems the right thing to do, given what they've been experiencing. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll, we'll see if Jin Cheng has anything to say. I do know there is a new hyperacusis trial going on uh, at the University of Iowa. Uh, it's uh, hyperacusis activities treatment. I think they just uh, got funding. And so that's that's one um, uh, one piece of research that's ongoing. But I'll just throw this in as well. I do a lot of work with veterans who have trauma histories. Interestingly, they come to the clinic to talk about their tinnitus and they end up telling us that their sound tolerance is a bigger problem. So even though there really are not a lot of hyperacusis clinics, uh, I think it's worth the clinician uh, and the patient's time to recognize that the the sort of coming into the the healthcare system might be because of tinnitus, but that doesn't mean we can't also be addressing problems associated with loudness tolerance at the same time. Yeah, I agree with uh, Mark, and uh, you covered all the points. I just wanted to uh, chime in. Uh, it, it is uh, the central sensitivity uh, disorder, and uh, the both the tinnitus and hyperacusis of the uh, you know, the causes of the, the loud now noise trauma, and uh, we all know can cause both, can cause both the tinnitus and hyperacusis. And uh, so you would think of the, uh, in terms of their underlying mechanism, you know, 
and that will uh, guide the treatment, right? So uh, there will be uh, similar or different. So they do have a uh, similarity and uh, differences. So one um, a point that uh, our scientists, our clinician, clinician scientists, uh, uh, wanted to focus on with the with the intolerance or uh, reaching to the pain uh, sensation, you know, that might uh, involve uh, is, is called a nociceptive uh, circuitry in the brain, and so the sensitivity in the central level, and that basically is a kind of a provide uh, a some t some type of uh, the input a conversion in the a higher order of uh, the brain. And that uh, uh, trigger this is intolerance and, and even pain. So uh, there, uh, there's uh, some uh, type of uh, you know act you know research and and really try to see okay if we are targeting a not not susceptible pathway and uh, can provide a relief. Uh, one um, another approach that uh, uh, the uh, you know targeting the inflammation and uh, so this is a one area because of their etiology. Uh, you know there is a resemblance between the etiology of, uh, of tinnitus, and so and uh, the inflammation, uh, medical inflammation uh, that in theory uh, could help uh, uh, retweak the uh, maladaptive neuroplasticity underpinning of uh, uh, hypercusis. and. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, there's no publication yet, and but anecdotally, when I have a conversation with uh, uh, patients, uh, so they they did it. Some have tried using infrared light, and this seems to provide relief. And you needed to consult your doctor about before you do that, and also you encouraged it to uh, look into what this is, does. And uh, and earlier I mentioned that uh, the targeted so um, in subcellular organelle, it's called a mitochondrial. It's an enzyme inside of from C and oxidase is a, a very important enzyme to uh, uh, regulate uh, the energy level in the cell and also the uh, cytokine uh, uh, bad stuff. We call that uh, reactive oxygen, uh, superoxide or react reactive oxygen species that can affect uh, the healthy uh, state of, of the cells. And so that's uh, in terms of the scientific thinking of that one. And there is um, a paper I recall, uh, cochlear implants, we know that uh, are used for uh, patients who have a profound or severe hearing loss. And uh, it reported uh, uh, it can provide a certain degree of relief on hypercusis. Uh, this is the information I know uh, so far. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, you're starting to talk about, uh, cochlear implants. Um, I have kind of a, a combined question. Maybe we can start with, um, uh, uh, we'll return to the tinnitus, um, focus here. Um, we're curious about um, what the research shows about the effectiveness of hearing aids to reduce tinnitus perception, um, but perhaps we could uh, we could start talking about that and segue into the uh, the bimodal uh, neuromodulation with the linear device and, and maybe how those could compare if we know that yet. Um, so maybe um, could one of you uh, provide kind of a brief comment about the effectiveness of hearing aids as it relates to tinnitus? Sure, I could. Yeah, I could start with that. Um, what, what I uh, like to tell patients uh, when I'm encouraging them to consider getting hearing aids, and, and we do this with patients even who have near normal thresholds. Um, the idea would be, well, uh, this, this, you know, probably one of three things will happen. One, you'll not like them, never use them. And that happens to some people. Number two, the hearing aids may help you communicate, but they may not help with the tinnitus. Now, communication is, of course, important. And one of the things that a lot of patients do is blame hearing problems on their tinnitus. So very often what we'll see is that hearing aids will actually facilitate communication, yet the patient will continue to hear their tinnitus. In that regard, it's an excellent opportunity to counsel the patient regarding the differences between their hearing loss, their hearing difficulties, and their tinnitus. If tinnitus and hearing loss were the same thing, then maybe we could say hearing aids would do the same thing for both, uh, at least for more people. 
And then the kind of the third option that can happen is that the hearing aids actually will provide some relief for the tinnitus as well as communication benefits, in which case we can talk about that central auditory nervous system and how at any given moment, it has a finite amount of energy available to it. It's up to the patient to distribute that energy as effectively as possible. So of course, we can all go home, sit in a dark closet and listen to our tinnitus and we'll hear it very well because it will be the only thing occupying that pathway. Much better, and hearing aids can help with this, to bring in environmental sound, to enrich the environment, enrich the sound environment, to actually take up more of that energy in the auditory pathway at any given moment, and by doing so, take away energy that the tinnitus might otherwise have been using. Do we have proof this happens? Any guarantees this happens? No, but I can guarantee to the patient that if they do not try hearing aids, and hearing aids are an option, I can guarantee to them that it won't happen, right? So I think it's always worth thinking about that when we have difficulty controlling the tinnitus, and of course, this is a big concern for a lot of patients, a lot of individuals, one way that a patient can exert control is by controlling the environment, perhaps with a little bit more purposefulness than they had been, and hearing aids can help with that for sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll we'll start to talk about um, the linear device here um, as another option. So um, the question we received are, what are the thoughts on the science behind the linear device, um, which is a bimodal neuromodulation device? And, um, you know, how, how might this compare to other treatments um, for tinnitus? Um, Jin Shang, do you want to um, start us off with some of your thoughts around the linear device? Um. So uh, Lanier device yeah, owned uh, by Neuromod and uh, in Dublin, Ireland. And so that's uh, there uh, already got uh, de novo uh, FDA approval and to reach out the market in the United States. So our audiology clinics, uh, they have, uh, if they're certified, got a training they can provide and the, um, the device. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, based on their uh, published information. So why the, um, you know, because they show robust therapeutic effects, and this is kind of the synchronized uh, application of uh, a sound and electrical stimulation of the tongue. And uh, the scientific basis is basically to maximize uh, retweaking. Uh, again, see here, different way to retweaking or reset uh, the uh, maladaptive neuroplasticity, uh, the underpinning of tinnitus. And um, so uh, they showed their uh, clinical trials and the published and showed uh, uh, the data that convinced the FDA to approve. Uh, right now, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, you know, encourage our audiences or our tinnitus uh, uh, patients to uh, uh, consult your clinician audiologist who is certified or ENT doctor who is certified who happen to provide this type of services, right? Uh, in terms of so far in the general public, uh, to my uh, knowledge, um, I have not, you know, uh, known uh, the established in the, you know, once you reach the broad market and the really, you know, all the patients are, and uh, so beyond uh, their published study, uh, that uh, knowledge information uh, is not known. So at the same time, the you know, so uh, it, it's uh, up to you and uh, the clinicians or you after a full consultation before you making uh, your uh, the uh, educated I use the educated decision. So that's uh, my view of this. There's no uh, established it in general, um, you know, facing the general public uh, the the populations yet. Yeah, yeah, it is a rather new device. Um, and uh, we at UCSF offer this device and have um, certified providers available. Um, but uh, just, you know, kind of watching how it's been used and just general success rates, um, our our thoughts are it, it seems like more of another tool in our tool belt and it could work for some people, it could not work for other people. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. I saw a comment in the chat, you know, um, 
I think I've lost it now, but um, uh, oh, why is linear so expensive and it's not covered by insurance? So um, insurance is, is a big factor in a lot of these decisions. Um, when, you know, when you have tinnitus, oftentimes those treatments, um, you know, in the hearing space are not covered. Um, you could imagine that if someone has hearing loss and could benefit from hearing aids and potentially that will help with communication and with other aspects of life, you may want to pursue hearing aids that is also rather expensive, but hopefully has some insurance coverage um, prior to trying the linear device. Um, you know, doesn't mean that you wouldn't try it at some point, but, um, you know, it, it's kind of working with your clinician, as Jen Shing, Jen, Jin Shing said, um, uh, about, you know, kind of using the most appropriate tools given, you know, given your situation. So, um there are other bimodal neuromodulation uh, therapies available, and just in the interest of time, we won't talk through those too much here. But um, I think it's it's important to know that it is uh, it is another tool, and we're happy to have that tool. Um, but it it has never been purported to be a cure for tinnitus. Um, it's really uh, just another management tool. So um, so I think that's that's important to keep in mind. Um, Let's see. And so um, thinking about um, other other options here, I think that there's a lot of uh, popular videos online showing effectiveness, um, you know, and kind of anecdotal evidence around different therapies. Um, I think, you know, if, if you're on social media, you, we've all seen these videos of pulling, tapping, massaging, and pounding exercises. Um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll just, I'll just kind of quote the question, uh, that, that doctors recommend on the internet. So, um, I think, uh, you know, there's a question around, is there actually any research evidence that there, that these exercises are effective? Um, and is this something that, um, that folks should consider along the way? I can, um, Provide there is a, a paper published by a, a German a Germany group. It basically there is a, you know the exercise. Uh, there is a inverse relationship uh, uh, between you know exercise and also the blood serum concentration of uh, TNF alpha. It's a cytokine inflammatory cytokine. So basically, you lower the uh, the level of uh, you know, infl inflammation, so uh, in your bloodstream, and uh, at the same time, there is uh, inverse relations, uh, inverse relationship between the blood, uh, blood serum concentration of uh, the inflammatory cytokine and uh, the severity of a tinnitus. So uh, uh, certainly, uh, appropriate, uh, uh, you know, based on this study, in this is a human study. And uh, it should provide a benefit uh, uh, to uh, you know uh, people who uh, uh, have a proper you know exercise. So that's yeah. the scientific basis. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. You mentioned there is one paper. Do you know? Has it been um, published again? Has it's it been published. kind of validated? If you, if you Google search, you should uh, this keywords inflammation, exercise, and tinnitus. These are keywords that should uh, pop up. If not, uh, send me email. I will <laughs> try to provide the yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think it's it's um, important to know that there are several tools available. Um, you know, when it comes to research, it's uh, helpful to see. Um, uh, studies replicated over time. Um, and so if you have a one-off paper that shows an effect, I think that can be promising. Um, but seeing additional papers come out over time with additional evidence um, kind of creates that stronger recommendation. Um, so I think um, at this point, um, it's not necessarily guaranteed that any of these exercises could help. It's pretty low cost, pretty, um, you know, you can apparently do this at home. So if, if you can try it, see if it helps. And if not, you know, you can you can certainly follow up um, with a with a clinician to talk through um, next steps. So yeah, that's um, all. That, if I could really quickly, I had a please. student who saw one of those videos, got very interested in it. It was the Shigong beating the heavenly drum maneuver, which is basically uh, kind of a, a slapping the back of the mastoid process by you know kind of snapping the fingers. And we ran a couple dozen uh, subjects on that, and there was really no effect. Um, but as you said, Becky, there's 
you know, very little ventured in this one. It's very easy to do at home. It doesn't cost anything. And if these kinds of maneuvers are anything like a, a lot of other tinnitus interventions, they probably will work pretty well for some folks. It's just tough to generalize those findings to the population. And I think the problem is people see these videos and they just assume it's going to work for the general population. And sadly, uh, that's rarely the case or never really the case. I want to yeah. quickly jump in here, kind of related. So any medical conditions, if we all know, especially for tinnitus, so, um, it a, a, has a, such a complex etiology. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, effective management, and uh, you would think because of the complexity of the etiology, the causes, and so your treatment would be also should be complex. In other words, it should be multidisciplinary. So you you in taking the accumulative of uh, uh, you know uh, mentality. So a little bit of exercise, a little bit of this treatment, a little bit of that. You you edit it. You make sure okay uh you know you do this it works for you and do that work you add it together uh you know hopefully you know your conditions uh, are quite reasonably or even satisfactorily uh, under control and that accomplish your you know your uh, your goal of seeking therapy so that's another way of philosophy or or ment uh, mentality approach mental approach yeah, great points. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour, but I'd love to just tackle two more questions here. Um, I think uh, one question that's on everybody's mind and why we have such a robust um, uh, attendance today is um, the question around, you know, is there is there hope for a cure? Um, and uh, maybe I'll toss it back to you, Jin Shang. Um, earlier, I already uh, mentioned, uh, you know, a number of uh, uh, lines of research and the different way of uh, uh, try to tease out uh, the underpinning of tinnitus and uh, uh, what uh, you know options or what treatment options can be developed. It's constant. It's a scientific. Uh, even the uh, you know the uh, uh, hearing aids, right? Right now there is artificial intelligence come up, and that uh, was quite a new years back. But right now it's a very common. You could imagine there is a new science, a new the drug. There's no pill, and uh, we're actively pursuing. So, uh, what do you mean cure? We, we, you know, so if the, the conditions disappear, would you say that it's a cure, or or effective completely is gone? So we we'll we we'll say that's a cure, right? And um, how to define that uh, uh, definition? A cure. Um, but we are seeking the very effective, um, you know, a way of managing this tinnitus condition. And so, and uh, I would say with the ongoing advancement and science and the new clinical uh, options are, are being developed. So it's a, a, a high hope. I would say it's a high hope uh, for uh, to do, to find a, a most effective uh, uh, management as for tinnitus condition, and uh, if it's completely gone, would you say it's a cure? Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration; it's a cure. Uh, but we are seeking the effective management uh, and make sure the conditions under control does not affect affect your daily functioning. Uh, so that's our primary goal. And yeah, I guess I, I, I would add to that, you know, when there are some cases actually where tinnitus does get cured. So a person has a middle ear problem, they have a middle ear surgery, and the tinnitus that they'd been hearing while they had that middle ear problem is gone. So again, there will be some cases of tinnitus that are medically manageable. But I completely agree with Jin Cheng on this idea, and I think it would be, I think it's helpful for patients to recognize the possibility that they can manage the tinnitus and coexist with it, even though there's no cure yet. Uh, there may be a cure down the road for everybody. That would be fantastic. N honestly, nothing I would like better in life than to be put out of business by something like that. But until that happens, I think it's crucial that we all keep in mind that tinnitus can be managed. Everybody has different ways of having to do it. Everybody has their own challenges. But while we're waiting for a cure and while we're chipping away at it, Let's make sure that we get patients everything they need to be able to manage the way their tinnitus is affecting them so that 
coexistence with the tinnitus, again, becomes something that is realizable. Yeah, excellent. Thank you both. Um, and and it's a great reminder as well that, um, you know, there are a lot of management strategies that can help with tinnitus that are currently available and also in the pipeline. Um, we will have another session uh, in the spring um, that will focus on more management questions as well. Um, so I'll, I'll mention this at the end again, but um, uh, feel free to to attend that session and, and learn more. Um, but in the meantime, um, I think we've, we've talked a lot about current research We've talked a lot about, um, uh, you know, things that are in the pipeline. Um, all of us here today are very motivated mm -hmm. to contribute to these shared efforts to find excellent management strategies that work, you know, across different different patient um, different patients. Um, so, uh, how how would you both recommend that folks here uh, get involved in tinnitus research? Um, are there certain steps that they can take today or in the years to come to to stay involved in that? Uh, I could jump right in here. Sure. Join an a, join a doctorate of audiology program and volunteer for research. And while you're at it, take it, take some courses in tinnitus management and come join us. Uh, there's obviously a lot of room for professionals to be providing more help than we have been. And uh, we're always looking for help there too. But Getting into studies, I think Jin Shang's probably got a better perspective on that than I do, but uh, I think ATA uh, can also help inform patients of uh, opportunities that might be available in their areas as well. So I would I would sort of keep in touch with ATA in that regard as well. Yes, ATA is active uh, in sharing the information of the ongoing uh, clinical trial uh, around the world and uh, certainly in the United States here. And there are some sites that are already approved. We all, we all know that uh, the uh, clinical trial needs to have an IRB approval uh, before a patient. So the sites have to be approved. And you know you can check the information from uh, the uh, clinical uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And all the, uh, the new clinical trial have to be uh, published in the government site. And so uh, you uh, certainly go to the website, welcome to go to the website to search uh, tinnitus, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And so once you get in, so you can search tinnitus as a condition. So you can see your active, you know, which projects, which uh, clinical trials are actively recruiting. Uh, and uh, my trial is actively recruiting. Uh, I have, uh, have, you know, have uh, Miami, have Michigan, two sites. And San Diego side is uh, targeting military personnel, and they're they're about uh, to uh, to open enrollment. So uh, and other colleagues of the trial, and uh, you know they're open. You're welcome to check uh, uh, the uh, whether you feel because everything must be informed, and uh, participants are uh, must know, and there's consent. Uh, you know, so we follow all uh, rigorously follow the protocol for human protection. That's a number one uh, rule. And uh, yes. Yeah. And I will um, also mention, you know, ATA is a great resource. Um, we also stay connected with several um, support groups that are available. Um, you know, these are people who have shared interests and also are interested in, in kind of staying in the loop for these research studies. So um, connecting with the support group uh, can be useful just to know what, um, what research opportunities are out there. Um, and, and also, you know, um, share your experiences and, and get that support in your community as well. So, um, really taking advantage of the resources that are, that are, um, available to you, um, can be, can be very useful. Um, so I know I we've, may, we've gone, please. I may, uh, you know, so, uh, since I, I took the chair of duty of the board, our American Tinnitus Association, and uh, I wanted to just to share the vision of the ATA. And so ATA has been around for 50 years and uh, after the founding of uh, Jack Warner. And so uh, we really hope uh, ATA uh, will be the home uh, for patients and to come to seek information, seek help, and also for the um, clinicians and to use this uh, platform to exchange uh, their know-how to further uh, polish uh, their way of uh, managing uh, patient, uh, manage a tinnitus condition for patients. 
and uh, provide a platform for a scientist and uh, a technology a developer developer and to come together and to develop a new way, new drug, a new uh, medical device, eventually to serve uh, our, our, our audiences. So um, uh, that's the message I have been sharing and communicating with the board and the staff. Uh, we do have uh, quite a dedicated uh, efforts from all the board and the staff and towards uh, this common vision. I just wanted to uh, share uh, this message to you. Thank you very much for your uh, support and uh, attending. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jin Sheng. Um, yes, and, and ATA uh, has a, a small but mighty team that is um, that's powering this mission. So um, we thank uh, Joy, who's in attendance today um, and really was the, the powerhouse behind um, creating this meeting and putting this all together. Um, we thank the, the staff and, um, and of course, also uh, our, our two guest speakers, um, Dr. Mark Fagelson and Dr. Uh, Jin Sheng Zhang. Um, and, uh, and as a reminder, we will have another session in the spring. So um, please do submit any questions that you have that were not addressed today to our um, to our email address. That's going to be tinnitus at ata.org. Um, and uh, and please, you know, please do feel free to to keep in touch with us. We're we're here to kind of um, you know support you and be part of that community. So um, thank you all for attending this session today. Um, I know that uh, folks have some other other things to do today, so we'll uh, we'll go ahead and and close the session. But again, thank you so much for attending. Um, there thank will you. be a recording available, so feel free to um, review any of those details um, afterwards as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right.